I want to start the actual machining and making of the crutch. Now, typically in the past, and you could do this a lot of different ways, but I'm just going to want to go through this real quick. Some of the things that really didn't, didn't work. In the very beginning, this would be a typical motor mount crutch on a Vico Chief, let's say. There'd be an eighth inch plywood former, an eighth inch plywood former here. And that was, that was what was formally called a crutch. Now over the years, several, several things would happen to a crutch in the old days. First off, the motor would start to sink in from tightening the bolts. In the old Fox 35, you'd leave the impression. And then what would happen, the motor would start sinking in this way or it would cant off to the side. The spinner would rub on the nose ring. So what had happened is over the years, and this is Big Jim Greenaway's technology, by the way. This is the stuff we basically learned from him, and it worked to perfection. Rather than making a crutch, and this is on the Pattern Master plans, among other planes, and I think all of my planes, because this is technology that works well. We always put aluminum, eighth inch aluminum, under the motor. Between the motor and the motor mounts, and what it does, it spreads the load out and keeps the integrity of the plane. So that as years go by, the motor doesn't start to sink down, up, over, one bolt gets tight. And as you're tightening the bolts, it doesn't put a stress on the crankcase. So these are motor mount pads. And we, when we actually started our business in the 80s, one of the first products we made was motor mount pads. Now, what would happen with Big Jim is because the tank had to slide in and out on modern designs, you didn't have this former. This is the former that you don't have on modern designs because you don't glue the tank in. Years ago, you would have a Vico tank and bury it with glue. The tank would be part of the former. Well, now with removable tanks, you still have a former either at the end or somewhere. But then Jim's idea was to put cross-grain half-inch wood if it was half-inch mounts, but with the grain going crosswise. Now that works fine, no problem at all, and in the days of Super Tiger 60s where you had to deal with a lot of vibration, that was a way of getting rid of the vibration. Now the upgrade for that has been, is I've used what I call hollow mounts. I take a table saw, and if you look at the cross section, and it's on several of the planes, they're, they're C section. And I take this material out with a saw blade. And one of two things. I would put this against the doubler. Or, if you had the doubler here and you wanted to get more glue area one way or another. But either way, they never broke. And then I would, well, you can figure where the other one would be. So what would happen is you, have, you wind up with a hollow crutch when you're done. And this would be cross grain wood. This is cross grain. The center would be hollow. Now, because this motor is, is silky smooth, I think we're going to be able to get away with that. We're also going to, of course, use aluminum pads. And one of the things that I found in, as years have gone by, things that didn't work, things that worked less good. Now, a lot of planes that I had over the years that had problems with vibration and fuel foaming, years ago this was one of the things everybody used to do, and nobody really singled out, I'm trying to sketch in the motor here. They would right behind the motor start drilling holes in the motor mounts to lighten them up. And boy, this right here is a stress riser. And typically a lot of those planes had vibration problems. Ultimately, a little crack develops, oil gets in there, and you have a vibration problem. So I, this is one thing I would recommend unless you're inclined to do so. I don't like drilling holes in the mounts because where the first hole is is the stress riser. If you're going to taper mounts, a better way, or just another way to do it, and we're looking from the top, this seems to work better, but it's a lot more complex filling this in with half inch wood. You've got to fit a lot of hand fit parts. And when I've done a crutch this way and a, and a crutch 
that's basically two C-sections. The one that's two C-sections is usually a little bit lighter and a little bit stronger. So what we want to do is, the first thing we have to do is take, and we're going to try to do this with 3 8 by 5 8 mounts, we need to run it on a table saw and take out this material. Now when we do, where it ends, and let's picture where this is going to be from the side view, it's not going to end like this. It's not going to end. Right there would be a stress riser. What's going to happen is where it ends, there's going to be a very gradual taper because of the shape of the blade. It's a very large diameter blade. So we don't get a concentrated stress riser right at that point. Now, even if we did, and we've seen this on Jose's plane where the motor mount system is really oil soaked, old, and butchered up, and, and there's not a lot of it left, and we got 440 bolts. All of that together hasn't given me a problem. But on a new plane, I want to absolutely guarantee that we're not going to have any problems. So I'm going to use 632 bolts. Again, this is a 90. I also want to use 3 8 by 5 8 mounts to, to keep the width of the fuselage where the spinner is going to blend reasonable. Otherwise, I'm going to have a spinner that's the fuselage is going to look, and I'm going to be trying to blend it into a spinner. It's going to be awkward. So, again, trying to do that just for cosmetics. But we're going to see if we can make a nice crutch with using 3 8 by 5 8 mounts. And these, by the way, are the, the mounts we have left over from some of the cardinal kits so we always have a nice supply of these and these for for whatever reason or always made a nice narrow body well now that the body's wider this is going to contribute to keeping a body looking to normal width the other thing I wanted to start I just mentioned this I had originally thought of doing this with half inch square mounts which pretty much weigh the same as 3 8 by 5 8 but here's what I was afraid was going to happen. When I start tapering the front of this, the fir first off, the first blind nut winds up poking through the fuselage. I know that's an, that's an issue. When you want to use, and I want to use a standard, well, the, I've already got the mold made for the spinner. So I want to kind of get this taper in ahead of time if I can. And you can see that by using 3 8 by 5 8 mounts that taper gets a little less severe and until I actually make one I'm not going to know how practical this is going to be but we're going to start by trying to make a crutch that would be very similar to one from a cardinal kit except the mounts are going to be much wider because the 90 case again is this is a quarter inch wider than it than it would otherwise be. Now we got this really nice Makita table saw with a brand new blade and what I always do is the, as the first thing try to do a little test cut to make sure that I uh, I want to have about an eighth of an inch of material here when I'm done. I'll just do a groove. Now remember it's not going to end at a 90 degree angle. And I've also done these with ball end mills and all kinds of other things, but a saw with a really nice sharp blade. And of course this blade is a brand new carbide blade, so oh boy, this looks like it's going to be a really good saw. Now, so the first thing here is, is to get one groove, and then we'll move the rip fence over, get another groove, and another groove. And I've marked where, where I want this to end, and now I'm going to make a mark right on the saw of where I want it to end, so these will all come exactly to the same spot. In fact, I put a piece of blue tape out on the saw where I want this to ultimately end. 
And of course, you can vary the second, the depth, just by by raising or lowering the blade a tiny bit. So we got the first cut on there. So I started by making four sets, and you might be thinking, well, they're match sets, and I color coded each one, and color coded them the way the grain was going. Now, next step will be to move the blade over an eighth of an inch or so and, and make the next cut and then the third or the fourth cut until we have the C channel machined in there. Now the reason I'm making four is in the past when I've tried to do this invariably some of them warp. Just like when you uh, do molding some of them don't come out good and I didn't want to have to go back and reset the saw up a hundred times to do this. And if they all come out okay even better but then when I'm done with this I'm going to weight them because inevitably some of these or 10 20 percent heavier than their sisters so we will number one look for nice straight ones and then the lightest of the batch you think the only wood that you have to weigh is balsa wood I don't think so motor mounts get weighed too now I always do this whenever I've got to work on a saw because first of all I'm not working on a, a legitimate table that's the, the first problem here is this saw is too big to put up on a vacuum bench. But the next thing is, I want to measure this off. I want to move the rip fence over and get some idea of how far. Uh, so and it's better to take a bunch of little bites than one big giant bite. level but it didn't work out the way I wanted. It. it looks like I'll be able to do this. This is going to take four cuts. But the only way I'm really going to know is by doing a test. The only way I'm really going to get the saw to work is, and I, I don't know why, I always take that, I guess I'm just old school. Now you can see I've gone a little bit too far. See, I've left a little ribbon there. So now the trick is going to be... Oh, we're going to do it in four cuts anyway, but I need to take a little more material off. I feel like... Uh, like that guy in the Yankee workshop. By the way, Elliot Scott provided us with this saw. And needless to say, we thank him for it, but... They always take the plug out. It now looks like it's ripping it out. Now we'll go back through all the pieces for the second cut, the third cut, and the fourth cut, and obviously at the end of it, we're going to have a C-channel that's 125 thousandths around the whole perimeter, hopefully. Now after all the, uh, the rough cutting, the rough sawing, Graham weighted each one. These are 36, but look what happens down at the other end. We got some 32, we got some 31 and a half. So that's five grams on each mount, that's ten grams, it's almost a half ounce difference when you do a pair. So, and luckily the two lightest ones are a matched pair, which we had pre-coated. So what we have is we have three spare sets. They all stayed pretty straight, which amazes me. 
And now I need to hand finish that groove because there's always little saw marks and things in there. I want to hand finish that up and that'll, that'll probably be all I get to do today but we'll be ready for starting a crutch tomorrow or the next time we're going to work in the shop. Well, it looks like we finally got gotten to the beginning of winter here. And luckily, we're not a bird. <laughs> and so it's time for us, and today we covered up the pond. Looks like a, one of our first really nasty winter days is coming. We had frost out this morning. And so we don't know if we're going to even steal any more 90 test days. Well, we don't even care because we're going to start building. And as I always predict, it's that tree. It's that tree we watch as the leaves turn yellow. We know it's time to start ordering some balsa wood and get some parts ready. Get our plans made. Gerald Shamp's copying the plans up hopefully this week. Our rough sketches. And the tree has no leaves and we're ready to start building. Alright, so go make a crutch. You got the birds fed. They're all out there happy. You got your Halloween decorations. Go downstairs and make the crutch. Well, before I start any project, boy, we hate to see the winter come. In a lot of ways we hate to see it come, but in a lot of ways it's the best time of the year because I really am, I have a lot more fun building most of the time than we do at the flying field when it's very iffy at the flying field. When you're building, you have complete control of everything. You can. You can build any time, day or night. You're not dependent on the weather. And the most important thing, you always have a nice hot cup of Javalia coffee. Javalia. This gets me started and I'm ready to work. Okay, now we have a rough idea of what the side view of this crutch is going to be. But we don't have the top view laid out yet. The reason we can't lay out the top view is we don't know because of not having the crutch made how wide the 90 is ultimately going to be. I know it's going to be wider than a traditional plane. There's a lot of little detail improvements we're going to be making. Now before I even start making up the crutch, one of the things I wanted to make is a little list. This is kind of a uh, and I like to keep this handy because I want to think about, and this, this is really a critical thing. Some of the things I didn't like about the previous year's plane. The flap adjuster. That's something we're going to change, eliminate, upgrade. But, but that's one of the things I want to upgrade, improve on this plane. So I always think of what are the do's and what are the don'ts. Well, one of the don'ts is, and again, this is something... This is something a lot of people don't even take into consideration. They just build a plane because that's what they want it to look like or whatever. And, and the downside of working that way, one of the things happens is you're always trimming flaps and moving things. If the vertical CG is right on the money, you have a lot less trim issues. So I know last year's plane was wrong. We've moved the wing. We don't know if we've moved it enough because we've, we've changed a lot of other dynamic things. But these are things we want to keep track of, the do's and don'ts. The don'ts. Now, I had a small issue on this plane with the, the, the uh, and I'll call this the nose clear. I wasn't happy with the way I approached that. I tried upgrading it and a lot of other little detail things, but it's what I'm going to do on this plane is take the whole fuselage except for where the wing will be out in the tail and do the whole thing with a coat of that Brookings Clear because we did have and this is something I don't know that we're going to be able to, to even upgrade or that Uniflow with the with the big props I notice even Midgley's plane it bleeds raw fuel from the Uniflow and it was getting on the plane and it something I'm going to look at maybe changing or upgrading one of the things, we have a way of curing it on a Testarossa, but I want to have choices. I want to have a lot more choices. But again, I want to have the do's and the don'ts. And some of the do's are light finish. 
by really being ultra careful, I was able to get the finish on the Testarossa under seven hours. Now I'm going to be doing some fancy scoops on this plane, some real exotic scoops, and I've been looking at Ferraris and Lamborghinis and whatever, Porsches, but, but this is going to be a key part of this plane to make it unique. Now I really loved the way this worked out on a Testarossa, and I want to continue that little tradition of having a scoop on the side of the plane. And I want to have, in, in conjunction with the vertical CG, I want to be able to have wheel pants right from the get-go. Now last year we ran out of time, we were doing a lot of other things, and the wheel pants, we didn't even get them finished, I don't think, till after the Nats, or just before the Nats, and then the vertical CG got even worse, and we, we built ourselves into a corner. Well, we're not going to do that this year. This is going to be part of the plane. So I, I always want to have a little list of do's and don'ts that I want to consider when I make next year's plane. Also, I want to reinforce, because I did have a crack in the flap where the horn... There was a little crack in a flap, if you remember. I had to patch that, and I noticed, well, Brett Buck had a similar issue. He had his horn come loose, I think, because of rain. But I'm going to try some a much better way of reinforcing the edges of the flaps when we get to that point. That's going to be one of the upgrades I really want to make. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this list. I'm going to enter it into my little database. And what I want to do is, every time I think of something that I really either didn't like or needed an upgrade, I want to put it on my do's and don'ts list. So hopefully each plane, hopefully, gets a little better than the one before. And, and in the case of, let's say this, if, if you just built, as Bob Lampione has, a beautiful plane, a little too heavy, maybe you need to cut back on some of the finish. If you don't have any unique features on last year's plane, it's too vanilla, think of some, some better aesthetics or a fancier paint job. And in our case, we, we, we really have to get this right. The, this vertical CG and the ability to put wheel pants and grass gear on, that was a frustrating part of the Testarossa, that, that we were always compromising that. Now another little detail improvement I want to make, and it's not a big, this, none of these things are big deals. These are little detail improvements. If you look at the blind nuts that are sold now, they have a much bigger surface and four prongs, and that's nice. That's a great idea, except for one thing. In here, where, this, where the threads are, these are very thin. And what I've seen other people that run 90s and run these big four strokes and stuff, now I want you to look at the nut on this side. See how much more meat there is by the thread? Even though it's smaller, these are the old Dubro nuts. Now, luckily, Brian had a bunch of these, and several people sent me a few. I put a thing out on the Internet, but notice... I'm thinking now for a 60, or for even for a 76, these would be no problem at all. And probably, and, and in the case of 440s, I don't even consider, I have 440s holding in the 90 now, and I haven't broken any bolts, but I'm just trying to make this plane really bulletproof, and I think for a 90, it's appropriate to have 632 bolts. Now, I managed to get some of these, again, from Brian, but... The, the reason I'm using them is twofold. Number two, when these stick on the mounts, and let me just get the mounts here, what's going to happen is these mounts, we channeled these out the other day. I made some spares. This is going to get taken away, a lot of this material. And what's going to happen with this nut, see how it sticks out over the side of the mounts? Now, these, these nuts are really made, I guess, for half-inch mounts. But this one, less of it will stick out. And I don't want that when I have to grind that off. What I'm afraid of is as we taper this, because this plane is going to be highly tapered in the front, a lot of these mounts are going to be ground away. And then what I'm going to see is that blind nut sticking through, which almost, I almost guarantee that is going to stick through. But this will minimize it just by having these. So what, I, what I'm suggesting is if, you have a, if you're going to do a 90 ship with, 3 8 by 5 8 mounts, you'd want to use the older style blind nuts. And there's two or three little reasons that I just went through, but certainly nothing wrong with these for most applications. But what we're doing with this 
Because the fuselage is going to be wider, I wanted the 3 8 by 5 8 mounts, and I've used these on all my Cardinals, so it's nice. These are even on the plans of the Cardinal kit. So I know these are going to work fine. Gives you a lot more glue surface, too, by the way, as a side benefit. And it makes for a nice rigid crutch. We're going to build a crutch today. But this is one of the little detail upgrades I wanted to make before I start. Remember, this is hopefully going to be what I'll call a real 90 plane. We're hoping to get year after year of service. Take the engine in and out a lot of times. A lot more than, say, a sport plane or a plane that's already fully developed. So I don't want to run the risk that we're going to have a, a blind nut either come loose or wear out. And I think this kind of stacks the deck in my favor. Nothing worse than if you have a plane all buffed out to have to cut into it and replace a blind nut. Now, there's a lot of little details I have to consider. And what happens in the nose of a 90 ship is we're going to have to make a lot of compromises. One of the compromises is that we need to allow as much room for the tank as possible. I don't want to give up a quarter or an eighth of an inch of tank room because I may or may not have to make special molds to make some special tanks here for people that are building 90 ships. Again, I don't know. Until we actually finished with the plane, I don't know. But one of the things that limits how big of a tank you can put in, if you put the motor mount pads back like this, you, you can't put the tank back here. So what I wanted to do is, and I cut these off in such a way that what I want to have is these end where the motor ends so that I can drag, it makes getting the tank in and out a lot easier. The only reason this angles on here is so that the tank can ride up over that. I want to be able to take the tank out of course. But I also want to have, and I'm going to be real careful about it, I want to have the front screw just out of the way of the motor. And so the first thing was I cut and angled these back. So I have the front screw and I only need one screw holding it in. And then when I put the back plate on the motor, this will be flat. <clears throat> Give me the most. See, I may have to make a tank that's bigger than one inch. And I don't know if I'm going to have to do that yet. But I want to have the option of making that tank a little bit thicker, a little bit wider, a little bit wider. Because I know I'm limited in the length. With a nine inch nose, I'm not going to be able to have a six and a half inch tank. So every part of this is a limiting factor. And I want to have that limiting factor. I want to use up every bit of space. I want to be able to bring the tank right up on the back of the motor if I can. <clears throat> and if I have to, I'll make a little clearance V for the header. So that's one of the considerations in this design phase. Now Rich Jacobone wants to use a, an extension unit. And we don't have one made yet. But one of the things I'm going to do is allow because I don't know the exact thickness I'm going to use up here. I'm going to try to make a much lighter thrust washer and I don't have that yet. I don't have that in stock. So I'm just going to move this back for now and when I get the final spinner back plate and thrust washer I'll cut this off and then put the curve in here. So for right now I'm just going to add just a little bit of material and leave the motor a little bit further back than it needs to be and I can trim this off with the spinner back plate when that time comes. And getting this that I have the full range of material here for the tank. Now if we were going to use a plastic tank I could cut some of this away but in the past and I've done my own little tests for me I want to use a traditional tank. I've, I've not had the kind of runs that I'm happy with when I get involved in tanks with clunks and things moving in them. I always like that traditional stunt run. And by the way, this motor, the selling feature of this motor is the stunt run. Is the friendliness and the predictability of the stunt run as one of its selling features. And I would not want to trade that away by putting some kind of a, a, an experimental tank. We have enough experimental stuff on this already. So step one in making a crutch is I need to go get, and again, by the way, these channels could be mounted both ways. I've made, I've mounted, <coughs> excuse me, both ways. Doesn't seem to be a giant difference no matter how you mount them because you'll never tear this apart when this is glued into a fuselage side. Not that I can tell anyway. But for right now, the thing that we want to do is get an exact place we want to put this, get the wood screw holding it in, and then set up to drill the holes. 
Now the first thing I always do before I'm even going to start a crutch, I want to make sure that the mounts that I'm using are not going to warp, hopefully. And I've checked these against a straight edge in every dimension. Hopefully they're going to stay that way because as moisture, and we're in a, a high moisture area in my cellar, you never know if that's going to warp a little or twist. But I want to make sure, and I've got my sandpaper, sticky back paper glued to the table. I want to take just a few thousandths off each side. That gives me a fresh side to work off on each dimension. And every step of the way, I want to check that I'm not building a little mini pretzel here. And it's little detail steps that I've found, like those little blind nuts, that a lot of people build a plane, and the next year's plane has the same problem. They build a plane that's too heavy, and next year they build another plane that's too heavy. Well, I've done that, so I <laughs> can speak from experience. Or they, they don't look to upgrade. I mean, the whole objective of building a new plane instead of flying the old one would be that you could make it a little straighter, a little lighter, have a little bit better power curve, have something. In our case, the, the things that we'd like to upgrade on a Testarossa, very predictable, very doable. And you don't know until you've had a plane, and then you go to build your next plane, what those things are, or you would have upgraded them in the first place. So one of the things I did, I had to run these on a belt sander to get them exactly to thickness. And it's easy to do that. I don't want them, I don't, in other words, what I don't want to have is have this sticking out on either side because I want the, here's what I really want. Let me show this. When this is put together, I want that kiss in the engine and a really tight fit. I want that to be as tight as possible up along the side. Now, what I did is I carefully measured this off. I want to make sure this is centered and that I have a little tiny bit of clearance on each side. What I have is an old, one of the old awls. You can use a piece of sharpened up music wire just to set that screw. Now, I don't want to drill this hole. In the past, I've drilled it and that screwed in just doesn't get as good a bite. The awl gives it the best bite, I think. We're going to find out in about two minutes here. Let me just make sure I got it centered. And then I have various sizes of so small screws that we use for all the little projects that we do around here. And I want the ones that are going to sink down. So I don't want to have it sitting up above that because we're going to be real close. The problem with a, with a tight motor fit, if, or if, if you've ever seen motorcycles that have a lot of things going on in a very small area, a lot of exhaust pipes and ignition wires and... Everything gets crowded and everything has to be figured out real accurately. And that's the problem with what we're doing. There's going to be a lot of tight fits in this nose. we got to get in a tank. And I'm sure that's not going to be uh, an undoable thing, but it's something we have to consider. I want to make sure that's lined up nice. And see that head doesn't stick up. It's down below. So when I rest the motor case on it and I set it up to drill the holes, that's an extremely tight fit. There's only a few thousandths on each side. And the next thing is I've left some on the front. When I put the motor, the real motor in that has the spinner already attached, then I can put that taper in there too. So now we have the two. And by the way, one of the things I've done in the past with channel mounts, if you mount it to the inside or the outside, it doesn't seem to matter. But, but you don't want to mount one to the inside and one to the outside. That's the one thing I wouldn't want to do. I'd want to keep them symmetrical. So in this case, what I want to do, I want to make sure I have these even, these even, and we're ready, we're pretty much ready to set the motor in place. Okay, so what I did, I put a drop of CA along the edge of each pad just to hold it in place. And then what I want to do is go back to my sanding belt because I don't want this aluminum sticking up. When I go to put the fuselage side on, if it's there, I'm not going to get a good bond, so I want to make sure I have a really nice flat surface, and you can see because it sands off the anodizing, 
and we've got this pretty accurate, but it never hurts to true things up. We use this sticky back paper on the table all the time, and it's it's always to your advantage to have everything as true as possible. Now what I'm going to do is put some masking tape, it doesn't matter, green seems to show the pen marks the best, because I want to get some accurate, again I'm trying to make this as like in overkill accurate mode, that just shows the, the marks that we're going to need to line this up. I want to avoid that screw hole. I want to have that even in the back. And you can see I've got just a little bit sitting out. And I've got both of the sides exactly flush. Now to spot those holes, a lot of ways, I want to use a piece of aluminum tubing because it leaves a nice mark in the tape, relatively accurately anyway. Now what that's going to allow me to do, now I'm going to cut that little piece out with an X-Acto knife, a little pointy number number 11 blade, and then I'll be able to spot these holes accurately. And again, there's nothing more aggravating than these are in crooked or twisted or getting everything lined up on a crutch, so important. So when you go to drop the motor in, you drop the motor in, the motor actually acts as a former. When we build a crutch, this is our jig, this is our building jig. But if everything's not accurate, if you've done this with a hand drill, and these holes, by the way, what's nice about the 90, these holes wind up right in the middle. On some motors, the holes wind up right on the edge of the mounts, and you can imagine where that's going. But by, by being right in the middle, that's going to allow this to act like a giant former in the middle of the plane. Certainly to our advantage. Now the next step is going to be to accurately get these holes drilled. And this is where absolutely have to have a drill press at least to get this as accurate as I want it. And I want to get a, a starter drill to spot these. And once I spot them, then I want to go back and look at, put the case over it and make sure I'm not off even a little bit. Now CJ, just starting those, they call it a dual, but I call it a starter drill. And the, the objective of a starter drill is it doesn't wander around. Now if I look in there, I can, I can hold this up against the case. See that I have a few thousandths of clearance here, which is what I want. And I can see those holes are pretty well lined up. Now it's the time that all the time we spent organizing our shop, it, it really starts to pay right now. Because we can find things and we know where things are. And And you can see with a starter drill, all I've done is, and it's pretty simple what it does, it's got these centered and it, they're not, now when I drill it with the drill that I need for this diameter for 632 screws, what's going to happen is I'm going to use shoulder screws so hopefully they'll be nice and solid in here. They won't be wandering around and flopping around and everything. So every step of this I'm trying to make this so that what, in essence what I have, when I put that 90 in here, I just have a giant vise that's going to hold it in. And by the way, in case you've, well, where's my truck key? This is, this is what we use to start, and you can buy it in any machine shop. When you start a hole, this allows you to start a hole, and it doesn't wander around. If you've ever tried to drill a hole in something in the drill, you go to drill it and it starts doing this, this doesn't. And, and this is a dual number three. These are about, oh, six, seven bucks, I think. Not a big deal, but these, if you want to make a nice precision crutch, you almost, you almost have to have one of these. I'm sure whenever you want to make something.
something that's that's nice and accurate and that drill starts just as you touch the material it starts wiggling around it just makes you crazy sometimes the difference between having a really good job and a really mediocre job is is a five dollar tool and the nice thing is once you buy the tool you pretty much have it forever unless like me every once in a while you lose something Now before we drill the holes for the screws, I'm going to go back to the motor, make sure these line up exactly the way I want, and then get the drill that's going to be a very nice, nice crisp fit for the 632 shoulder bolts. Now I want to get the, the, the size that I want to use for one for line nuts is 135, and I have in some ways organize my drills but what I need to do now is start getting out the real nice relatively sharp ones and what I used to do is is like this one is for 632 blind nuts among other things so I always have the ones I use up in a box the ones I use commonly and I need to get out a 135 sometime what I'll do is I'll just mark them with tape and then I know which ones they are now these old blind nuts, the old style ones, are, are a lot thicker than where the hole is drilled. So I want to get an accurate number. They're 185 in fact. And so what I want to do is find a 185. And what this allows me to do, you know, just I've taken the drill and put CA enough washers on. You can do it any other way. So that I don't countersink that hole any more than I need for the thickness of the blind nut. I just want, I don't want to remove more material than I have to. I don't want to make the holes bigger than I have to, but I do want to account for that. Now if I don't account for that, what happens? I tighten the blind nuts and almost guaranteed the mounts have some splitting and you lose strength. Now that allows us to have exactly the amount of relief we want to have down there so that the blind nut, I wouldn't want to drill a hole any bigger than it has to be and I want to have a good seat for the blind nut at the same time. Now the next step on this is to and this is an optional step of course because and it's it's unique to the 90 because what we're going to try to do is we want to bury these blind nuts because of the severe taper that's going to go into the spinner. Remember we're starting with a much wider fuselage and we're going to have much more of a taper than you would on a normal plane. So what I'm going to try to do is, I have a little, a little grinding tool, I'm going to take these to the drill press and just sink them in just enough that the blind nut tops come even right with the top of the mounts. This is one of those really inexpensive bits that we got in that Costco thing. And you know, when you get a hundred bits for a dollar and a half, even if you cut one cut it's okay. Again, the idea is to keep everything 90 degrees as much as possible. Once it centers, it seems okay. In fact, you can get a... I, I want to have the thickness of the blind nut if possible. That's also going to help in our alignment when we line up the fuselage is we can lay that as part of the, it'll add to the, the arm that we can line up, get it a little more accurate. So here we are with our, what amounts to be, uh, Costco cheapy cutters. They seem to be working okay. What I did, I put a little bit of thin CA on here just to harden up the wood kind of act like a primer and get down in that little area. But now we should have some nice nicely recessed blind nuts. And before I put those blind nuts on, I want to get a little bit of oil 
or chain lube or something so that when I C8 them I don't C8 a bolt shut. Now that worked out pretty nice once the engine was put in position. Now the next step is I'm going to go around the edge real carefully try not to get any CA in the threads some thin CA and then I need to trim off the bolts right even with the bottom of the blind nuts. Now a tip if while we're waiting for the CA to dry if you happen to get some CA on the thread and it locks this up hold a soldering iron on the bolt and it'll loosen up the CA. But I, as many times I've done it, I want those bolts to be perfectly flush with the top. I don't want them sticking up even a little bit. Now the easiest way I know to get these bolts all trimmed off, I've tried to trim them while they're right in a blind nut, but I, I never seem to get that. I'm not happy with that way of doing it. So what I did this time is I just took the parting wheel, put a scratch on each one of the bolts. I'll take the bolts out, and then I want to cut it on that side of the scratch so that we're perfectly flat here. And what that's going to allow me to do when I line up anything that's in alignment, I can still have this line. Otherwise, this line, I have to lay this off the table and I lose this much of the alignment tool. And the longer I can make the alignment tool, the more chance I'm going to have of getting everything right on the money. And that, by the way, was one of the things I think that contributed to the Testarossa being as good of a plane as it was, was the fact that everything was in pretty good alignment. You'd come out of corners and it'd just stop. And that's usually a test of good alignment. So now I have that scratch on there. And I can pretty much use in vice grips is the easiest way I know to do this. Just cover up half of that scratch. If you ever try to hold bolts by hand or with pliers, you know they just jump right out. And by the way, this is a great $16 Dremel tool. I go with the Dremel tool. It's an all trade. I wonder if this thing really has bearings in it or something where a month from now it's going to fly apart, but who cares? It's so cheap. And what I do, I hang this up always having the parting wheel in it. So this is my parting wheel tool, so I don't really care. And it's got speed control. Hey, for $16, what do you want? I mean, if you're like me, one of the biggest nuisances is changing the tools all the time. I want to cut back that edge. Before I put this back into the blind nut, I'll put a drop of CA, a drop of CA, a drop of oil on it, so I keep a little bit of oil on those blind nuts at all times, so none of the CA from working on a plane winds up sticking. And once you put a drop of CA on those, a drop, why do I want to put CA in there? A drop of ordinary oil or chain lube that just keeps the threads that, that hopefully no glue is going to get in there and booger them up. We nice. I love having a plane where you drop the motor in, tighten the screws, everything just drops in. When you have a plane where you got to tighten this screw first, then loosen this one, then put, and then, and what happens if it's not a tight fit, the motor's always changing offset and the, just, it just pays to spend a couple days making a good crutch. See, that's exactly what I want, is to have this perfectly flat now. Even though the screws are tight, I've got them cut exactly the way I want. And hopefully not going to push wood up or glue into the, the soft top block and put a little distortion in the top block at some point in time. I'll just repeat the process on this side and we'll be done for the day. That's about all we're going to be getting done today. Well, that looks like all we're going to be able to get done today, but putting the wood between the mounts, among other things. Next time we get to work on this, that's, that's the first piece of the new 90 ship, and that's where the story begins. Now, boy, in today's mail, it just doesn't get any better than this. Check this out from Jim Tishy. Just check this out. I and 
Now I have to keep this for when I'm going to fly the Tiger Cat again and, and don't think that's not going to happen. The Tiger Cat is sitting there with the needle valves adjusted, the handle adjusted. It's ready to go. But anyway, here's the cool thing. Jim sent me a whole bunch of pictures from the Reno Air Racers and what's really neat about it, and obviously I'm going to treasure the shirt. I love t-shirts. I love, I love having a lot of nice t-shirts and of course because I don't get to wear anything nice and clean in my work. I'm always covered with epoxy or something. I like having a nice clean shirt. Jim, and thank you very much, but he also sent us some pictures from the Reno Air Races. And the, we have already thought of meeting Warren and Ramona Walker out at the Reno Air Races and kind of having, get Elliot Scott involved and maybe get a group of people together, fly into Frisco and ride out to Reno to Stead. We haven't decided if we definitely can do that yet. That'll be based on a lot of factors, but, but I sure would like to do it, number one. And I'd sure like to get a lot of people to come along with us. You never know who can make it and who can't. But anyway, that's one of our things. But let's look at these pictures from Jim before we start today's work. This is from Jim Tishy in California. Now again, these pictures are from Jim. Check these out. There are some in here that... And especially this time of year when we're all looking for new projects, new things to do. And I, I would really love to make the Reno Air Races next year and maybe even get John Kofaro to come out or who knows who can make it. We're going to be going in three weeks to Washington with Kent and Shelley and a bunch of other people that may or may not be able to join us. They go red. And it's this time of year you're always looking for paint job ideas, number one. Or some, some new model, a new canopy shape. Something to make your blood boil. And you never have too many of these pictures and videos and... But there's, you know, all the pictures in the world are nice. And of course video is better than pictures. But being there is better than anything. So if you got an opening in your life around a Reno Air Race time, think about it. You could be there with Wendy. Now he's got two pictures here. Hold on one second. And what I'm thinking is possibly he's got a little caption. It's his latest print over the next print for a, a full overview. Oh, I see what he did. Hang on. Let's try doing this. So if you wanted a full-size picture, you could create one by joining up the pictures. That's pretty cool. I will keep that in mind. And I'll be sending you out some more DVDs, Jim. But believe me, I appreciate this. Boy, and this is the kind of stuff when you're doing a detail job, it's hard to figure out. All the little trim, all the exhausts. When I was making those exhausts, and we may have some of these fancy exhausts on a new plane. And it's time to make a new mold. Our mold is worn out, so... Boy, if you're a Dago Red fan, how priceless is this? I think Bob Whiteley, among other people, has done the Dago. I'm kind of partial to Miss Ashley and Strega. But there's one thing I'm really partial to. And there it is, flying at Reno. It would almost been worth, <laughs> worth it right out there for me to see it. Oh, man. I can't imagine anything anything more Reno-esque than a black tiger cat. Sea Fury, now it's my understanding, a Sea Fury one, but I don't know which one. And I know Joe Adamusco already has drawn plans for this, for precious metal. We even have video of this with the with the counter rotating props starting up. That's a, and I think this is the one Paul Winter even did one of these that uh, silver and green. But here's my honey. Oh my God, am I going to treasure these? See the nice thing about having the nice thing about having pictures on video. Well, you go with these pictures; these get lost unless you have them in a frame. They get wrinkled. They get twisted. But if you have them on DVD. They're as fresh as the day you put them out there. And I will I will send Jim a, a copy of the DVD also, of course. 
as well as return his original pictures. Wow, look at this. Take a close look at this. It's a rare bear piston. <laughs> ah, here we go, Nessie. See, not like I'm prejudiced or anything, but I know Warren Walker likes Strega too. Oh, that's Reno. Reno. Uh, And Ken Tyser, of course, I think has 21 Stragas already. Now, how cool is this when you got the wings all folded up? And when we were doing the Tiger Cat, we had some, I think this is the one we had some pictures of. And we have since loaned that out to a friend that's building an RC Tiger Cat. Yeah, this is on the front strut. I remember that. Very cool. And I'm not sure. Boy, would I love to see some video of this. Again, if I go out to Reno, we'll, we'll put Skyfire back in business. Now, they don't make Skyfire videos anymore, and I'm not sure why. It kind of blows my mind that they don't, but if I go out, you'll have full video coverage, that's for sure. We get Rich Oliver to come out with us, too, with his cameras. We can shoot from three different cameras. Tiger Cats. And it's just never a time when, when something like this doesn't inspire me anyway. And I start thinking about projects yet to be, projects we've already done. Puts me in a mood to run upstairs and put the Tiger Cat in the van. And that's what I like about having it ready. Having a needle valve set, the handle set. It's literally ready to go. And it's going to stay that way. September Props Unlimited Racing Team. Now, everybody I'm sure remembers, if you're a video subscriber from years ago, Wendy taking a ride and piloting the AT6 and doing some aerobatics. That was Karen's uh, Father's Day gift to me one year. We have that on video. That's a cool time. The Thunderbirds. One of them, I've already done a Thunderbird F-16. One of the Sea Furies, and I don't know which one won. Of course, this would be nice if we had, if we had a Skyfire video, or next year maybe we'll have a, a Windy video. We won't need Skyfire anymore. More Tiger Cat photos. Here's a nice paint scheme. And here's the ones we always look for, the gold race. These are pictures from the gold race. Oh, can you imagine a lineup when they start these puppies up? Oh, here's the gold race winner, Mike Brown, Summer Fury. Now, the little caption, and Jim's got these little captions, he says, this is the winning Sea Fury. I'm not sure Al Raby wouldn't just drool over that one. Summer Fury. Well, Jim, I can't tell you how much I appreciate these. These really make me make me want to go to Reno. <laughs> Again, we always have that as our dream come true, but you know what? We're getting to the point in our life right now where we want to see some more of our dreams come true. We've worked long and hard, so has Karen, and she'll be retired, of course, by the time the Reno Air Races come around. And we'll already have our 90 ship flying, hopefully, and we'll be able to plan out next summer. So if you're thinking about it, give me a clue, too. Give me, uh, give me an idea what, what we could possibly do to make that a stunt thing. Anyway, Jim will be returning the photos, and I will return a DVD with them, and a couple of our 90 development DVDs. We're just starting a new project here with the 90 ship, and thank you so much. Okay, and the next step, on our crutches we want to get some cross grain wood between the mounts, but we're going we're gonna to do this similar to the way we did the Spitfires with a rib section. 
And so the first thing was to get some nice hard, this is not four to six pound wood, this is nice rock hard eighth inch wood. Cut it up so it fits between the mounts. Now this next step, once I get that wood tack glued in there, and it's just tacked for right now, I need to make sure I haven't built in any kind of a warp, and there's an easy way to check it. Now it may seem like overkill to be doing this with a mic instead of just eyeballing it, but for my purposes I want this to be as accurate as possible. And a lot of times if you're building this and you're not careful you can build either a bow, a coke bottle, something that's negative. Now, there's a nice little trick to gluing this piece in and getting a nice flat surface. This is a really nice trick. I think Dave Midgley gets the credit for this trick. This is a sheet of Teflon. Just an ordinary, if you don't have Teflon, you could uh, use saran wrap even. Okay, and what you do is you lay that piece down, put some weight so have somebody hold it right in place, and then just tack glue it in. Then it's easy to check if you've built any kind of a warp into it or not, because when you lay it down on a table, well, you get rid of the Teflon. Now it's as straight as an arrow now. Now I can put a permanent glue seam on this. But I'd always, I don't want to put a permanent glue seam in and have to break the piece off because I've created a pretzel. So we're, we've marked off where the nine inches is. That's where the first former is going to be. And then this actually will become our tank box. Now what really is going to be a challenge here is to figure out, let's see, our tank box is much wider than it normally would be because the motor is wider. So we're probably almost guaranteed at this point until we're done. What I'm going to do is kind of make up a, bl a block of balsa wood the size that the tank would be. So I can see that every step of the way I can get the tank in and out, tank in and out, before I actually make the tank. And we're, what this is going to give us, the reality here, is we're, when that eighth inch piece is in, 2.4, almost a two and a half wide tank. 2.4 and I know I've got to allow for the screws and I'll maybe allow another eighth of an inch by five and a quarter and that'll be way over that'll be almost a, that'll be an ounce more than we need but of course we're going to have to make tooling for a new tank a new size tank or at that point in time we can decide we want to run the motor softer and not fill the tank we've got a lot of choices here and depending on if the plane comes out incredibly nose heavy incredibly tail heavy if it comes out real tail heavy, the first thing I'll do is make a bigger tank. I've done, I've divided this space up and I'm just going to mark these with a pencil line. Now because I've built crutches like this with the gouge bolt, with the, with the relief both ways, and not had a motor run problem and the fact that and this is really the bonus one of the bonuses of the 90 it's such a, a smooth running engine that's what that's normally these crutches when we used to build them for Super Tiger 60s with three and a half ounces sometimes more because you'd need solid wood and solid mounts and solid everything and all kinds of epoxy joints well we're gonna save some of that weight only because this motor is such a smooth running motor and because we're running it at at an RPM where it isn't resonating if we're running this motor at 10 grand this nose construction might be totally different but we're running it we're gonna gear this whole thing toward running 8400 with relatively low fuel consumption and I think and I'm hoping that my nine inch nose moment armor is gonna work out right on a button but Obviously, that's not the case all the time. So we want to have as much flexibility of construction as possible. Now, and the other thing we used to do with the, with the crutches is put epoxy and put them in vices and do all these things. And when you consider that we've taken the motor in Jose's plane and taken away about two-thirds of the motor mounts and that I don't know how much of the doublers and tank boxes left and that it's oil-soaked, now we don't even have the slightest issue with vibration. I'm thinking a nice new fresh construction here. This is one of the ways I hope we're going to be able to save just a bit of weight to bring us back to ground zero. Now what I'm going to do is put a permanent seam and just let that kick off. 
glue everything up permanently and then start putting in the formers. Now to set up the formers, I can take the stripper, set it up just a little bit on the plus side. I know exactly where that piece is going to be. Minus a tad. I want it sticking up just a little bit. Let's see, I have it. This is a relatively nice piece of wood, but it's nice and stiff. It's a sea grain. So I'll strip off a piece of this and use this to make my formers with. Another good trick, I always take the, the little stripper and do that because I've picked it up like that or stepped on it or whatever. Nice little safety tip. Uh, next step here is going to be get some of these cut off our masterpiece. And I want a nice tight fit. I don't want to have anything that I have to fill with glue. And this is the point at which I like to go by and get new blades, new sandpaper, new everything. And, and don't be tempted to try to use up last year's dope and last year's glue and last year's everything. And I always, by the way, I always like to get the CA right from Brodak because it's fresh. He sells a lot of it. The stuff that's sitting on hobby shop windows for three years and then you get it and you ever notice some of it it just doesn't kick off well keep it in the refrigerator we keep all our glue in the refrigerator now this this should be an each one of these should be a nice press fit but certainly not something that's gonna try to spread the mounts in any way I want to get a nice tight fit And it's a little more involved when you want tight fits. See, the other thing is every step of the way on this plane, we're going to be trying to make up for that three ounce handicap. But I think we're going to get some of it. When I'm done with this crutch, I'll know how much I've, I've nipped off of that. Plus, don't forget the nose itself doesn't have to be as long. So there's some material just in the longer nose that's going to, well, hopefully save us some weight anyway. But part of it, part of the thing I'm going to really try to do is get nice tight wood fits, even tighter than what I normally like, so I don't wind up carrying around an extra half ounce of glue. And get everything in alignment here. Now again, what I do, once that's in, it, and it's in, you, you don't have to touch it. Then I like to tack everything, put a little bit of pressure on the mounts. And just to drop a CA, put a little pressure on it, and then once I'm happy with everything, I'll go around and re-glue the whole thing like an egg crate. Now I purposely made it that it sits up just a bit off the crutch, and I have the, the bar that I normally would use just to dress it off. Now again, I've made crutches this way, and one of the critical things you need to know when you make this type of crutch is how big the tank shim is. Because what we're going to be doing is really gluing the tank shim in place, or most of it. And it's crazy to have solid wood in here, and then have a tank, a, an eighth inch piece of light ply or something that weighs as much as that wood, just floating in there and going along for the ride. I'd like the tank shim, since I know roughly what it is, to be part of the structure. Now that's nice and flat and now what I just need to do now is just fill in one by one by one and every step of the way put it back on my what is now the alignment jig here the table I gotta go to where the Teflon is and once you get it right it usually doesn't move but it never hurts to test and once these things are filled in and we're happy that it's nice and straight then I'll run the permanent glue seam on all of them before we go to the next step. Now, I would be hesitant to do this if I were running a Tiger 60. Although some of the Tiger 60s, like the ones in the Spitfire, worked fine. But, but you're really in a lower risk category 
with an engine that isn't a shaker. When you have a smooth running engine, there's things you can do to make up for it. And hopefully in the overall thing, the overall weight of the plane is not going to be a whole lot different than if we had put a smaller motor in or a Tiger 60. But, but it'll be a different weight. A lot more of it will be in the power plant, less in the tank, less in some of the other things that, that you normally need to... Uh, if you have a plane that vibrates, you really, you're, you're limited in a lot of ways unless you want to live with having no motor on. But this is going to be a... Well, any new plane like this really is an experiment. It really isn't... It, until we make the second one or the third one, it's all nonsense. But we're taking a real good guess. And really, having Jose's plane, that has been critical to making this happen. That's been a critical thing to making this whole project happen. Okay, so we got that step up. All of these are perfectly flat. Now we're just going to figure out how we want to make the tank for. Now we know the tank shim is going to be just a little bit higher than our pads by maybe oh, a sixteenth of an inch the most. So we want the material that we're going to put in here to be no more than, well we want to allow ourselves a little bit of a shim, but roughly an eighth of an inch or maybe a little bit more. Now before I go any further I want to get all of these glue seams as solid as can be before I make up the tank floor. What I do, I just let the glue run its normal course. Let it run down that way and then reverse it. And this lets me know that the internal part of this as the glue runs into each corner. Now, the last thing, whoop, as he forgets his Q-tips, ah, as he drops them down in the black hole in space. See, you don't think this stuff happens. You think we're rocket scientists now? Nah. Werner von Braun, we're not, that's for sure. Okay, so that gives me a solid, hopefully a solid internal joint. Now I'm going to make up, and I want the grain to be cross grain. I got some really, it must be 20 pound eighth inch balsa sea grain that I'm going to make the floor going side to side. There's no, I, there's no strength going this way. All the strength we need is going in this dimension. Got it. And boy, you know how you always get, you buy balsa wood from whomever, and what happens, you always get those parts that are 20 pound. Well, this, this must be 20 pound sea grain. But it's still a lot lighter than anything else. But it, what's good about this, you could never make a shell out of this. It's really rigid. So one of the things that I do is I mark this off. And I can actually leave this piece on. I don't even need to worry about it. But I need to get slow CA for this. Let's see if I got any. I just ordered a bunch from Brodac, and these are, these are, let's, in fact, let's just see, these, this looks like an old one. I'm going to go get a brand new one. See, and I'll save these for something like cosmetic stuff. These are from last year. Now, I took a brand new one for the light, but I didn't take one for the heavy, and what'll, what'll happen is this glue will, you know, it's still usable, and it's good for cosmetic the reason I like to save these for cosmetic stuff, and I'll put these back in the refrigerator, is a good reason. When you're doing a cosmetic like seal on a surface, you want that extra little work in time. But right now, we don't want any work in time at all. I want that stuff to kick off in a, you know, in 10 seconds or so. This makes Karen crazy. <laughs> we have our, uh, our soda and up in his downstairs refrigerator and some mayonnaise and stuff. Oh, what we happen to have is 25 bottles of Brodac CA. But now the trick is, these are the old ones, and I'll note the old ones just by looking at the top. Put these on the side, and when I'm going to do cosmetic work, these will be the ones of choice. But I want to get a brand new one. It just, it's just foolish when you think of the time and money you put into a plane, and then not to have the best glue possible or the freshest. Remember, it's not. Nice. And another thing, keep the kicker. This is a Bob Brookins trick. Keep the kicker in the refrigerator. This is our two-part kicker. We're hoping we're going to extend all the lifespan. In fact, I even wrote on it on the lid, store in fridge. 
And of course, don't ever come to the, my refrigerator at night looking for a glass of soda and pour in the kicker or whatever. Now I've got exactly on here where this is going to go. And I want plenty of glue on here, especially on the mounts, because I'll sand the edges off. Now I tried always, in the past, I used to try to cut these to size. Found a much better way is just leave it oversized and trim it in place. That's, I think, the best way to do it. Now you can always tell how good CA is by how quick it kicks. And if you need kicker, for whatever reason, and so some is oozing out here already. When you need kicker, after about 30 seconds, save that for your cosmetic work. There's no reason to, not to use it, but don't use it for your structural work. And that really is a good tip. I mean, there's a lot of reasons glue joints fail. They get soaked with oil. And they don't fail, but the wood that they're attached to, the, the oil is capillary, fuel is capillary, and it it lets that joint release. So having a good a good whole crutch area that's not gonna get not gonna turn into like we have on our test plane where it really is soaked. Okay, that's that's telling me that glue is nice and fresh. And once I know that's that's good I can just trim this off, leave about an eighth of an inch. And I can either trim this with a belt sander or with my block by hand. But it certainly, it, it gets me in a little bit better position here. And then of course I can just go on to the next piece and the next piece looks like we're gonna need three pieces here eventually. But making a good crutch and being able to save a little bit of weight and having it either just as strong or stronger, well that's the best of all worlds. I'm not sure that's not the world everybody wants. And it wasn't a, like a five minute job to figure out how to do this. This is the kind of stuff I think about all night while I'm laying in bed and watching the Mets take a pounding and then the Giants take a beating. But, but in the end, I have a good idea. Now this normally in the old days would have just been an eighth inch light ply tank shim that was going along for the ride and adding 10 to 12 grams of nose weight. And then once it got oil soaked, it would add 15 grams of nose weight. Well, one of the things I found, and, and I'm going back to the Harold Price days of my own uh, coming up the ladder kind of with building tips, is, and Harold used to say this all the time, he'd say, well, everybody in the world, even a monkey, if you give him enough kits and enough glue, eventually he'll figure out how to make a good ringmaster. But, but the trick in life was to find out how to make it without having to go through a 20 year learning period. And I think to a big degree, all of the sources of information that we typically use, magazines, videos, once somebody shows you how to do something, boy, or that it can be done, or, they just, or that in the best of all worlds, they just inspire you to do it instead of sitting around watching, or watching some of this dumb TV that we all are subjected to. Okay, now, when, once this kicks, all of this wood that's going to be on the outside, I just need to trim off, but I'm going to do it over on my sanding belt. I'm going to take off the, the majority of this with a razor, leave about a sixteenth, and then true this right up. And all of this is done with the motor right in place as a jig, and every step of the way I'll be checking all my alignment that I'm not building any kind of a warp, just like when you build a wing, no difference. I want to leave about a sixteenth of an inch and trim the rest off with a sanding block. So I know I'm maintaining my 90 degrees that way. And again, this is just one of the things that, once you know where, and that was one of the critical things we had to learn from the development program, from tape, I don't, I don't even know, if, going back a few tapes when we were shimming tanks and everything, now that I know that, that's a critical piece of data and that allows me to make what will be 
potentially the tank shim, and I'll leave a little bit so I can always go up and down just to f and fine tune it, but but if I didn't know now, and I had it like in last year's plane, we put a big gouge in the mounts, that, that just was, was added a lot of extra work for nothing. Now when you have it, and, and this is one of the things a lot of people pick up from the video, just little simple things like having some sticky back paper on your sanding table. You know, if you didn't have that, boy, what a handicap. Now I'm using the edges of the motor mounts to make sure I've got a nice, what I hope is going to maintain, a nice 90 degree beveled edge. And boy, when that's done nicely, that's, that's just as good as it gets. And as the last thing, I'd take my, the block that I know is perfectly true. Make sure I've got that edge just about as good as I can get it. Now what I have is some of this pre-cured carbon fiber, and this is this is some of the stuff Les bought years ago. And anytime you want to attach this, especially if you want to attach it with CA, the choices are you can use secondary bonding resin. We can use CA as long as we roughen this up with 80 grit paper. The side that we're going to put against the wood, we need to get 80 grit paper and roughen it up. Now what I did, I put this on a little body shop pad. You really want to roughen it up, it's got to be rough. Any composite part that you glue, paint, prime, or want to attach something to, there's a very, very slim chance it's going to hold real well unless you roughen it up. And they recommend on secondary bonding resin, minimum 80 grit, this is 60. But it should make for, uh, well, we hope. <laughs> now I'm going to do both sides for a simple reason is I'm going to want dope to stick to the other side when I fuel proof the tank box. So I may as well do it now. It's a lot easier to do it now. Now because this is pre-cured and pre-preg, it's really a lot stronger than if we just laid in some carbon fiber and resin onto the wood. It's probably two to three times stronger. Again, because it's pre-preg, it's oven cured, this is already post-cured. We just have to make sure we get a good tooth. Another thing, anytime I put some Sickens M600 on this, you just get any degrees because they, they obviously use release agents. You don't want any release agent on there when you make the final bond. This worked out good in the Testarossa. We used some of this on the Testarossa and it, it stood the test of time very well. I'm going to get it really dry. Sand it well and M600 it. Okay, now, what I did, I put a piece of this, again, this sheet Teflon on the table. And what I'm going to do, and that's to help get this to be a perfectly flat surface if possible. So what I want to do is put thick CA. Nice, fresh, thick CA. And this is one place we don't really have to worry about skimping because this will flow into all the little nooks and crannies of that carbon fiber. It's already oozing through the little pockets, which is what I want. I want it to come through, but I want to make a flat surface too. And I'll just hold that for a minute or so. Whatever oozes out on this, we'll sand it off.
It's a nice little tip, and that was a Dave Midgley tip. Yeah, that's the whole point of, I guess, all video and all, all these articles and magazines and stunt news and everything. The idea is to share the information. And if you do that, I just think you'll get a lot more out of, the, out of our sport. You get a lot more out of life. A good old sanding, sticky back sandpaper on a flat table comes to our rescue again. And we can rough this in. Once I get it close, then the last little bit I'll do with that hand sanding block. This dresses it off pretty quick. Huh? And again, as soon as I'm done, I vacuum up that dust. That dust is a killer. Do not want to breathe any of that carbon dust. Do not. As soon as you're done, vacuum it up. Actually, it's not good even to, even to be breathing the wood dust. Now the next step on this crutch, gonna be a little, a little tricky. We have to go get the, the test plane, pull out the motor, and get a real accurate alignment up here, so we can put the taper in this crutch. And once we get to that, get that part done, we'll. I think we're well on the way to having a underestimate just how important it was for us to do all this preliminary testing and. Jose's ship and all the things that we learned from it are now going into the database but there's one thing left we have to do I have to get this spinner fit right and I figured there's a very easy way to do it I'll just pull a motor out since it comes right out of here and while I have it out in the next couple days Scott Dinger is supposed to return our mufflers if we get another unflyable day we'll do our muffler development pass that on to Rich Oliver that's one of the things we still have to settle on is some kind of a muffling system but we have learned a lot and not much of the time we spent and I hope you know for all practical purposes you haven't really been bored to death watching this this ship fly it's an old ship it flies I think it flies pretty good with the 90 it probably flew pretty good with the Tiger 60 but we've we've had the option of letting a lot of other people fly it and Warren Walker Buddy Weeder among others John DeTavio and we've learned, gotten feedback from every one of them. And I think that's a critical thing in any development program. See, if the plane just flew great for Billy Warwood or for Paul Walker or for whoever, it might be a great plane. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. But one thing's for sure, and it goes without saying, if everybody likes it, there's a good chance it's good. So the next step on this, I'm going to pull the motor out, and it will finish up that crutch. Before I pull the engine, one of the things I wanted to test, I wanted to check, because we've made so many changes, landing gear, muffling systems, tanks, and I wanted to make sure that this wasn't starting to get heavy. And it isn't, it's exactly 73. And, and anybody that's ever flown a pattern master knows that 73, that's a, that's a very nice weight for a pattern master, and, and certainly the way this flies. I don't think the weight is even gonna be an issue. But imagine if we get this in a plane like the Testarossa, which is what very similar to what we're going to have. A little bit smaller, a little bit lighter. Boy, is this going to be a friendly package when it's done. And you know, in the beginning of this whole program, when I first showed people this motor, boy, was I met with skepticism. Ah, oh, you don't need a 90. Why would you put a big clunker like that in a plane? Why would you do this? Why would you do that? What a waste of time, what a waste of money. Well, in the last two months since we've been testing this and gathering data, I think to a man I've converted them. And that was my original, one of my original goals was. And I always tell people, if you don't agree with me, well, it's certainly okay, we can, we can still be friends, but it's not a real great idea to bet against me. You'll lose your money. <laughs> Sounds like a line from Scarface at a Godfather or something, doesn't it? 
but it's true. This has unfolded to be, uh, I think, just a great, a great development and been so much fun. But boy, we have run out of weather. The sad thing is the pond is covered. The heat is on. I even, I even had to cover my window up here where, where the air conditioner is now is full of insulation. We're hunkering down here for the building season and we still have Lampion's contest coming up. Now anytime I take the powertrain apart, I always etch up the prop. And boy, is that a good fit, especially on a motor this big. I noticed with any carbon fiber prop, after you tighten it two or three times, you get a nice shiny surface that tends to slip. If you keep the surface rough, now with the motor in place, this is all trimmed off now, and I've got the curve I need, or, or very close to the curve I need. Of course, it's oversized. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the belt sander and just put some of this in. But I want to leave, well, maybe a sixteenth on there, more than I need. Because as I bring the doublers around here, I'm going to curve the doublers and that builds a lot of strength. Wow, those aluminum pads get hot quick because we're grinding right into the pad. I just want to go a certain amount into the blind nut. I don't want to get too close to the threads. Because we really have a lot of taper. This is a wide use. Now, I don't, I don't want to take any more until I got to where I was rubbing on the case, and I might have taken a couple thousands too much, but I could always dress off the motor. No, it looks like it's fine. And I've got the curve that I want in. And again, this is a big taper. Normally, you don't have to put this much of a taper in. And I've allowed some thickness for the, uh, the fuse sides. Let's hope I've guessed right. We guess we're going to find out. And it's not a problem to build up a little thickness, but if I didn't want these blind nuts going, I didn't want to get into, well, I don't need the case now. That was acceptable, but I don't want to get any closer. But again, what happens with the crutch when it's this way too, this curve in the front actually adds a lot of rigidity. Instead of two flat sides, curved sides add a lot, a lot more rigidity. I think that's a pretty good crutch. I feel like that's a giant leap forward for mankind, for crutch kind. Now the next step on this whole program is going to be to deal with the mufflers. And we're going to uh, hopefully in the next day or so get tooled up, geared up that we can do some muffler testing, especially while we're in this gap of bad air. I think that was that's just about one of the nicest crutches I've ever made. And I've got, I'll trim off the back when I f see where that's going to wind up. I'm not sure yet. Just imagine out on the front of a big Miss Ashley. Or on the front of a big John Cafaro P51. And boy, did it pay to get everything